By the year 1917, the Russian Empire, then embroiled in the Great War against Germany, found itself hemorrhaging militarily, economically, and politically. Some 2 million men had already lost their lives in what appeared to be a losing battle, domestically prices had risen 4, 5, 6 times if not more, leaving some so desperate as to raid shops en masse for food in times of shortage. Worse yet, the public had all but lost faith in the ruling government. So Nicholas II had left the capital in 1915 to oversee the war directly from the front, leaving political matters in the hands of his wife, originally of German heritage, mind you, and appointing the controversial Gregory Rasputin to a powerful advisory position. The State Duma, originally meant to serve as a representative body with legislative oversight within a new parliament, saw the Tsar's departure as a fine opportunity to address domestic matters. However, the Duma had been repeatedly restricted in its abilities by the Tsar pre-war, as he feared the legislative body might seek to replace or remove him as the Empire's leader. As such, he laid out a specified set of powers for himself and established a state council, which might be compared to a Senate or House of Lords, to keep the Duma in check. This had led to several crises and constraints, which, come the Great War, left the Duma in either a state of paralysis or active aggression toward the imperial government. With the Tsar away from St. Petersburg, aka Petrograd, he was often misinformed or delayed in notice of the growing discontent from the public and the Duma. This allowed unrest and riots to build, seeing to the slow disintegration of imperial authority as the mobs grew in number, and saw increased support from law enforcement originally tasked with bringing the rioters in line. This change of sides having been on account of several factors including exhaustion with current hardships, rumors of treason committed by Rasputin or the Tsar's wife, as well as the most loyal and zealous of these law enforcers having been deployed to the front, allowing for their replacement by new, less disciplined recruits. Tsar Nicholas, in the wake of this, had ordered the dismissal of the Duma, and they, believing this act to be highly responsible, refused to comply, organizing a provisional committee of the state Duma which would eventually become Russia's provisional government once it secured power over the other governmental bodies with the support of the outraged public behind them. Like that, Tsar Nicholas found himself isolated. His government had abandoned him, the soldiers around him had mutinied or lost faith in the Tsardom, Nicholas's family had become captives of the provisional government, and all around him echoed calls for him to abdicate his throne. Seemingly left without a choice, Nicholas submitted to the demands of the new government, originally hoping his son or brother might still succeed him, but fate would not have it, bringing an end to the Romanov dynasty and leaving the family to be exiled from Russia. However, none were quite willing to accept them. Britain, fearing it'd be a bad move for publicity among left-wing circles, had withdrawn its offer to take in the Romanovs, and the same of the French, who worried even a slight break in national solidarity could cost them the war. This left the Romanovs stranded in a country which grew more hostile by the day, with seemingly no allies in the entire world. Quite soon, it became clear the provisional government wouldn't be able to send the Tsar and his family to a safe country anyway, as the Petrograd Soviet and those with far-left sympathies demonstrated increased resistance to what was perceived as an allowing of the Tsar to escape justice. The former Tsar, now merely Nikolai Alexandrovich Romanov, along with his family had become prisoners in the land they once ruled, with a warden on the brink of being replaced by one far more sadistic. Initially, the former royal family was held in one of their palaces just south of the capital, kept under house arrest but still awarded the same standards of living they enjoyed as royals within the walls of their own home. Turbulence in the city eventually changed this as conditions became ever more unsafe for the family, motivating their relocation by the government to an isolated western Siberian town. Nicholas, left with no responsibilities but to ensure the security of his family, invested every moment he had in both comforting them and keeping a close ear to political developments in the Russian West. His heart would fill with a foreboding concern as he learned that the provisional government had been overpowered by the Bolsheviks, who now limited the Romanovs to a bare minimum of supplies, officially asserting that in time the former Tsar would be made to face trial. But Nicholas had yet to fully understand the dangerous significance of this change in course. There was only so much that could be done from the confines of this gilded cage, leaving Nicholas with an ache of helplessness he just couldn't shake, even as he attempted to pass the time with his wife and children as if all would be fine. Nicholas's shortcomings as a leader haunted him during his captivity, questioning how as he believed a Tsar chosen by God to lead Russia could have failed his people to the point that they'd turn on him. Hope remained both between Nicholas and his wife that their situation would improve in time, either once an opportunity presented itself or upon their liberation by domestic supporters or the Western powers, but in truth quickly did they fall to the sidelines of British and French concerns, as they no longer played a viable role in the game against Germany. The Bolsheviks, though openly promoting putting the Tsar on trial, had already held the devilish intent to have him executed, regardless of the outcome. 
Lenin allegedly being at the head of this proposition, though it's impossible to say as Lenin exercised extreme secrecy on such matters, being known to regularly order the destruction of his telegram messages. That said, Lenin's view on the Tsar was made quite clear by repeated attacks on his character, referring to him as monarchist filth and, quote, the most evil enemy of the Russian people. This sheer hatred no doubt motivated a majority by the execution of his own brother following a failed attempt on the life of Nicholas's father, Tsar Alexander III, something which directly fueled Lenin's radicalism, and something which made the executing of Nicholas, in his mind, an ultimate revenge. The Romanovs were eventually transferred to a Soviet stronghold town east of the Ural Mountains, where their living conditions would deteriorate further. Kept in virtual isolation, the family soon adapted, and even befriended some of the men tasked with guarding them. This became so significant an issue that a ruthless veteran Bolshevik was appointed to straighten the guards out, one Yakov Yurovsky. As time passed and the Russian Civil War carried on, the advance of the Czechoslovak Legion toward the town where the Romanovs were being held raised serious concern that Nicholas might be liberated and give greater inspiration to the White Army. It's believed that Lenin gave the direct order to execute the Tsar, while Yakov Sverdlov and Leon Trotsky earlier encouraged him to execute the whole of the family as well, so that they couldn't open the door to a restored Romanov dynasty, though both Trotsky and Sverdlov would distance themselves from the execution later on. Some hours after midnight on July 17th, the Romanovs were awoken and led to the basement under the pretense of either evacuating or sheltering from the impending exchange between the Czechoslovaks and Bolshevik forces. Once the family was within the small basement room, Yarovsky read out the execution order, much to the shock and terror of Nicholas, now realizing he alone wasn't to be executed, but his entire family as well. Nicholas was the first to be shot, and according to testimony from the executioners, died immediately. The rest of the family wasn't as fortunate. The guards given the task were not experienced shots, many were using poor quality or outdated weapons, and some were even intoxicated. The outdated guns also filled the room with smoke, further obscuring their marks, the deed soon devolving into essential blind firing, but eventually it was over, and the Romanovs were no more. But what if that changed? What if in an alternate timeline, Tsar Nicholas survived? As Yurovsky raised his weapon, the Tsar narrowly evaded a killing blow, still sustaining a gruesome injury to his face and collapsing, appearing to have died instantly. Within seconds of Nicholas hitting the ground, the screams which echoed through the small room were overshadowed by a sequence of deafening shots, the basement filled with blinding quantities of smoke as the Bolsheviks turned their weapons upon the remaining Romanovs. As he laid there, Nicholas didn't quite know whether he was alive or dead, his injury in the disorienting environment locking him into a brief trance until he was brought back to reality by a pause in the firing a momentary reload. Acting with urgent swiftness, Nicholas leapt upon the guard in front of him, exploiting his clear inebriation to seize his weapon and turn it against the other guards, some of whom themselves disoriented by the smoke and surprise reflexly fired blindly in the Tsar's direction, some striking each other in the process. This fleeting disorder allows Nicholas to charge against his attackers using the guard he restrained as a human barrier, whilst dispatching them with his commandeered pistol. Having spent the last of his ammunition, Nicholas tosses the gun as a blunt projectile, knocking out one of the last of his would-be assassins, leaving only Nicholas and Yurovsky standing. The two wrestled over Yurovsky's gun, what could have proven the deciding factor in this matter of life or death. Though the Tsar lacked the imposing stature of his father, he developed a good deal of strength through regular weightlifting. This paired with his triggered will to survive, allowing him to overpower Yurovsky and emerge victorious. In this moment of calm, Nicholas would turn his attention to his family, hoping beyond hope that they had been unharmed, but alas, he'd been too late. His heart broke as his sole connection to the world slipped from his hands. He had failed as a leader to Russia, his ministers and generals had turned their back on him, his people quite well wanted him dead, the empire passed down through his family for 300 years had been stolen away, and now he had no one. The few who understood him who cared for Nicholas the man, the husband and the father, they were gone. He was no longer any of these things, the czar, the husband, the father, he was nothing. What is going to happen to me and all of Russia, he'd ask himself. Looking upon the bodies of his loved ones, it seemed clear what would happen if the Bolsheviks remained in power. Who would act in defense of the empire, in defense of the Russian people, in defense of families like his? Suddenly, he'd hear footsteps approaching. They approached calmly, but many in number. No doubt the remaining members of the interior guard coming to gather the bodies, not having been able to decipher the execution shots from the Tsar's own. Nicholas would quickly scavenge what weapons he could from the downed guards, troubled by their varying calibers and a general lack of ammunition carried by the guards themselves. 
arming himself with a gun in each hand and a spear tucked into his uniform, he'd lie and wait for the remaining guards to enter the room and take them by surprise, then moving through the house into an adjoining basement floor where he'd come across a mounted machine gun facing out to the open street. This would be one of three machine guns strategically placed throughout the house to prevent the Romanovs from escaping, and now it was Nicholas's only chance of taking out the some 50 external guards who would not simply allow him to waltz out alive. Nicholas also knew that in the attic above what had been his bedroom was another of these machine guns, one which would have faced out to the neighboring house where the external guards bunked. Additionally, there were some 200 men stationed in the surrounding area across various guard posts who would surely move on his position once he took action. Nicholas didn't expect to survive, but driven by a desire to avenge his family, he set out to extinguish as many Bolsheviks as he could before he himself ultimately fell. The house, which for weeks had been his prison, now became his fortress, one stocked with weaponry and protected by two 15-foot palisades. Barricading the entrances and checking for remaining guards, Nicholas would proceed to rain fire upon his former captors, picking them off as they desperately attempted to breach the house. The windows blocked out by newspaper and whitewash to prevent the Romanovs from calling for help, now obscured the Tsar's movements within the house to any soldiers outside, allowing him to freely move from one machine gun station to the next in a matter of seconds. Nicholas would hold out in that house for one week, rationing food, water, and ammunition until finally he was met by the Czechoslovak Legion, fully capturing the town just days later. When they found him, Nicholas was no longer the man he once was. He appeared as though he hadn't slept a minute the entire time he held out, his face was shoddily bandaged where Yurovsky had shot him, and he carried with him an expression more befitting of a wild predator than a man, let alone a noble. His wounds were tended to and he was provided a generous meal, which he refused to eat. The Czechoslovaks explained that they were traveling eastward hoping to reach a Pacific port in order to route back to Western Europe and avoid the chaotic situation in Central Europe. Nicholas happened to be in a fortuitous location, as it would, in the later weeks, come to form a central node for various factions of the White Army, who might find a greater sense of solidarity if only they had the right leader. Just for a moment, Nicholas hesitates, but recalls what timidness and hesitation had brought him. He looked around to the faces of the soldiers, all bearing a degree of weariness and genuine need. This war could not be won by divided factions, only by a singular front. A movement not for any one region of Russia, but for all of Russia, and all that it represented. The faith, the Russian people, and now, a better future. And so, Nicholas adamantly agrees to rally the White Army, so that they might finally crush the Reds once and for all. The image of the Tsar along with the legend of him single-handedly holding off some 200 Bolsheviks over the course of a week, fills the army with an intense pride and zeal. If they were willing to fight for the Tsar even following his abdication, their admiration for him now would be near comparable to religious devotion. When his soldiers at last saw him, he stumbled and left decision-making to others. Now, he held an intimidating presence and acted with fatal certainty. Truly, this was the man chosen by heaven to lead his righteous people against the army of evil. With the armies inspired and brought together through Nicholas's guidance, he would allow them to carry forward their half of the effort whilst he pursued his own course of action against the bloody Bolsheviks. While his forces trained, so did he, learning what he could in hand-to-hand -hand combatives and small arms usage for what would become his own one-man campaign. His first target was less a personal one and more a strategic one, an individual who could lead him in the direction he needed to go, Leon Trotsky, head of the Red Army. It would have been around this time that Trotsky began reforming the initially disunited Red Army into a largely unified and well-led unit, much as Nicholas would have now done for the White Army. Trotsky made it a point to recruit captured White Army veterans to instruct his own forces, many of whom complied out of desperation or fear. However, as the legend of Nicholas spread, so would the wills of these men remain strong, preferring to die at the hands of the Bolsheviks if it meant buying the White Army more time. Intel suggested Trotsky would be moving along the Bolshevik-controlled portion of the Trans-Siberian Railway to inspect forces near the front. Understanding the strategy would be rather risky, Nicholas and a small horse-mounted platoon of soldiers would infiltrate Bolshevik lines with the goal of hijacking Trotsky's train. A train which, upon seeing it, Nicholas could recognize as having once belonged to one of his ministers, now plated in armor and sporting several mounted weapons. Nicholas's men would run a diversionary attack on the train while Nicholas himself boarded the moving locomotive and dispatched the engine crew, bringing the train to a grinding halt before reaching the barricade they'd set up earlier. Nicholas would lead his way from train car to train car, catching by surprise a number of Bolshevik soldiers who would have had their weapons fixed on the assaulting white forces outside the car. This soon developed into a close quarters firefight as Nicholas approached Trotsky's personal car. 
Trotsky was armed and supported by three other men, but Nicholas made short work of them, subduing Trotsky and demanding he reveal Lenin's location. Trotsky resisted at first, but Nicholas was able to appeal to his infamous pride, suggesting his revolution could carry on without Lenin, but not without him. In that same moment, Nicholas bringing his weapon to Trotsky's temple, making clear he would not hesitate to pull the trigger if he did not get what he wanted. Trotsky nearly cracked. He restrained himself, but then realized his communications with Moscow would reveal Lenin's location anyway, and so attempted to bargain for his own life, with no success. But before the killing blow was dealt, Trotsky asserted that it wasn't Lenin who orchestrated the execution, but rather Yakov Sverdlov, with whom he personally spoke on the matter. Sverdlov at the time held the highest position in the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic, essentially making him the head of state. While Trotsky was certainly well protected during his travels, his position as head of the Red Army left him more vulnerable than those who remained near Moscow. As such, reaching Sverdlov would be no easy task. Nicholas would need to synchronize his campaign with the whole of the White Army to make Moscow breachable. Fortunately, with Trotsky gone and the Red Army deprived of valuable training, the now unified White Front would be able to mount a successful offensive against the Reds, forcing them to retreat far beyond the Volga River, soon bringing the city of Moscow under siege, at which point Nicholas would demand the arrest and handing over of Sverdlov alive. The city would be surrounded to prevent escape and cut it off from resources. Within a matter of weeks, Sverdlov was captured and hand-delivered to Nicholas for what would prove to be an excruciating interrogation during which it would be revealed that Lenin truly did order the execution, with Sverdlov and others merely supporting the decision. It was also revealed that Lenin had not traveled far, hiding out at the Gorky mansion just south of the city limits, where he had stayed since an earlier attempt on his life had left him in poor health. With that information in tow, Nicholas would organize a small team to accompany him to the mansion. Entering alone, Nicholas bypassed security, restrained the medical and help staff, and came face to face with the little red devil himself. No words were exchanged, but the seething expression on Lenin's face and the cold fury in Nicholas's eye expressed all that was necessary. What precisely went on in that room, none can say for sure. Nicholas's men simply watched as he walked out and Lenin didn't. Looking on in bewilderment as flames began to erupt from the manor's windows, Nicholas simply dismissing it, asserting that their work was done, before signaling them to ride off. Order was slowly restored to Russia, and Nicholas reclaimed his position as head of state. Understanding the people now saw what chaos followed from his absence, he was able to reaffirm the loyalty of those who once questioned him. Confident in his newly gained leadership abilities, the Duma was abolished and Nicholas reigned absolutely, though benevolently. His very presence evoked fear and respect from all around him, allowing his subsequent reforms to pass with great enthusiasm and success. Yes, Nicholas was all-powerful, but in his heart he'd been humbled. Leadership was an eternal burden, not a luxury. There was no room for his own pleasures, only the well-being of the Russian people. This was the cross he would carry, and he would do so proudly. But there was just one personal matter left for him to resolve. Nicholas had planned a trip to the Netherlands to visit a distant relative's manor, House Dorn. Finding the manor empty upon his arrival, he'd let himself in and wait in the dining room until his cousin Willy finally returned, the former Kaiser of Germany, Wilhelm II. Startled to see Nicholas in his home, Wilhelm would of course ask what he was doing there. Cousin Nicky would cut the formalities and simply ask him very sternly if he knew Lenin and his Bolsheviks had been granted free transport to Russia by Germany. Wilhelm, for a moment, is silent. Nicholas pulls a document he'd brought off the dining room table, standing up and describing it as a German train manifest, among the passengers listed being the alias of one Vladimir Lenin and several of his allies. He'd present him an additional set of documents which outlined German-sourced funding directed to Lenin and the Bolsheviks. Nicholas reminds Wilhelm what they had taken from him and asks again, did he know? Wilhelm, blood running cold as he realized the nature of this meeting, would nod his head in disagreement, asserting that he didn't know. Nicholas approaches him, causing Wilhelm to stumble back and trip, falling back onto the floor. He desperately pleaded with his cousin, asserting that he tried to give Nicholas and his family asylum in Germany, but was constantly dismissed by his generals. Nicholas sighed mournfully, crouched down to Wilhelm's level, and with a hand on his shoulder, said to him, I will believe you out of respect for our past friendship, but pray you spoke honestly, or God will judge you, and I will send you to him. Like that, Nicholas left Wilhelm trembling in the middle of his home, himself returning to oversee his empire, for the work of a leader is never done. And that is where we'll end this video for now. The US of Z thanks you for watching, support your legion by liking the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z!
out.